Okay, welcome to the first lecture of the second week. Uh, we just showed a video on, uh, in the 10 minutes kind of before class started, on uh, common physics misconceptions uh, in the classroom. Specifically, the context was for a life science uh, physics course, so it's very, um, you know, very applicable to, to, to us actually. And one of the examples they used was from motion, was from kinematics of when you throw a ball up in the air. Um, you know, a, a common misconception that physics education literature can almost pinpoint is that, you know, at the top of the arc, you know, we throw the ball up, it momentarily comes to rest. Um, that a common misconception in physics is that the, not only is the speed zero at that point, but the acceleration is zero at that point. And the video uh, talked about how, how, how much time it takes to to get students to actually overcome that misconception and uh, and allow them to be willing to replace that misconception with with new ideas and uh, I think it's just it's it's human nature we all exhibit this sort of um, uh, resilience not resilience reluctance to to replace uh, uh, prior constructs in our in our head with new ideas and that's something that's just sort of uh, I, I think commonly commonly ingrained in human nature so. Um, it just I, I thought it would be interesting to sort of show you that that um, worldwide this is by no means unique to UTM or U of T or Canada or, or whatever this is this is a worldwide phenomenon in physics um, that is well researched and well documented and uh, I don't know it's I think it's it's transparency is helpful where you know if, if you know what we're trying to do with you um, it might make all of our jobs a little bit easier right um, I will start posting, um, it was a, I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner, it's a brilliant idea. Um, I'll start posting these sort of um, YouTube video links on our course page. Um, that way if anyone missed the 10 minutes before lecture or you were here and it was an interesting video and you want to kind of, you know, click on the link and rewatch it, um, you can. So I'll start posting the links. It was a, a beautiful idea. I have no idea why I haven't thought of it before. Um, it seems at the, now, it, now that I'm, I have the idea, or someone gave it to me, I, it, it seems obvious to me. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I didn't think of it sooner. So I'll start doing that. Um, the other thing I want to mention before we get started is, um, if you look at the course schedule, just very briefly, because this week is kind of when things start getting busy. So I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. So here we are, sitting on Tuesday, July fourteenth. Uh, can I highlight? Nope, I cannot highlight. Um, so anyway, we're sitting on Tuesday, um, July uh, 14th. So this Friday evening, you have your first assignment that is due. Uh, you should have been able to tackle, I think, all but one of the questions um, up, up until the end of, of last Thursday's lecture. Um, I think there may be one question that you're going to need today's lecture for. Um, but that, I mean, if you haven't gotten to the, the other parts of the assignment, that's okay. I mean, you still have the rest of the week um, to do this. Um, so anyway, there's that coming up. I also want to mention that you're, you're quote unquote performing lab one uh, this week. Now, of course, we're in an online environment, so there's no lab to show up for. Um, you know, your TA is not going to be in a, in a session where you have to drop in and say, I'm here. That's not how this is going to work. Um, the lab material will become available, I believe, on Wednesday. Um, if you click on lab one, it'll say it's locked until a certain time. Um, whatever that time happens to be when it opens up, that is, that is what I mean by you performing the lab. And then that's when you can look at the lab manual, that's when you can look at the, the worksheet, the, the pre-lab quiz, um, and then the lab critique as well. Uh, you'll notice that Gideon posted an announcement saying he's going to have office hours, weekly office hours. Um, I think they're Monday afternoon. Uh, don't quote me on this. I think it was around two o'clock on Mondays. Um, but I can check the announcement or you can check the announcement. Um, feel free to, you know, drop in uh, with Gideon and ask him some lab questions. Uh, we chose Monday because it gives you a few days. I mean, if the lab becomes available on Wednesday, it gives you a few days to, to you know, either read through it or, or read it once and let it percolate because, you know, uh, you'll have a tutorial on Thursday, you'll have the assignment due on Friday, so you may not be able to get a chance to really sink your teeth into the lab. Um, 
you know, on Thursday or Friday. Um, we're, we're assuming maybe the weekend is perhaps where you're going to really sink your teeth into the lab and uh, maybe Monday would be a, a good, a good time for Gideon to be available. And of course, you know, email your TA or myself with lab questions as well. It's not like Gideon is the only, uh, the only expert with, um, with the labs. So um, by all means, uh, you know, shoot, shoot any of us an email, but Gideon will be live during a Zoom session that you can just drop in on um, for Mondays. Um, the last thing I wanna mention before we get the party started, if you can call it a party, is um, we have slightly modified, well, not modified, um, we've provided some more um, information for you regarding the labs. And, you know, it's a work in progress. We were having to redesign all the labs all at once to be online, uh, even with 137 now, like we're, we're having to, to remake the work, well, not remake, make the worksheets from scratch and, and stuff like that. So it, it's a work in progress. Um, one thing we've changed this semester compared to last semester is in addition to the lab guidelines, which you see here, right, this, this document we had last semester, this document explains to students kind of um, the different components of a lab report, um, the do's and don'ts of every section. It's a pretty comprehensive document. Um, it's pretty dense. And uh, in addition to that, we also had posted a formal lab example. That way, the idea behind that is students can look at this, this polished, relatively polished uh, sample lab and kind of know what it means to put all of those elements together in one final product. But um, it, it, we noticed that students were, were having trouble uh, marking these critiques last semester because you know you are in first year and you have limited exposure to formal labs so um, we we created a rubric um, I will give 100% credit to Romina which is I think on the call right now one of your TAs um, she came up with this rubric and you know I looked it over and I edited it but I, I by no means can take credit for for its creation it was 99.9% .9 Romina and um, we're hoping this rubric kind of helps students um, mark these lab critiques as we're, we're telling you kind of the main themes that we as a TA or we as an instructor would be looking for if we were marking uh, a lab. Um, you know, you'll, you'll notice here in this rubric, we're breaking down levels one to four for each section of the lab, you know, so there's the, the abstract, which is one section of the lab, there's the introduction, which is another section of the lab, there's the results um, or the data analysis, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's the discussion and or the discussion and conclusions, again, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's the appendix, and then there's just overall neatness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for each category, we, we've spelled out, or Romina has spelled out, um, kind of what a TA would look for for a level one, what a TA would look for for level two, what a TA would look for for level three and level four. And uh, uh, hopefully this helps students kind of see the big picture of kind of what we're looking for and helps you focus more on, on higher order details and not lower level nitty gritty, the commas in the wrong spot, this wasn't bolded, this wasn't underlined. Um, you know, yes, the formatting is important, but you know, ultimately in first year, we're not too concerned with formatting. We're mostly concerned with the elements that, that are represented here in the rubric. So, um, you know, for your first lab critique, um, you know, please use, use this rubric, review the rubric and, um, and, and let this rubric help you mark this, the, the lab critiques. And, uh, you know, hopefully that helps and of course we're always we're always open to sort of feedback so if this is significantly helpful compared to last semester it would be good to have that kind of feedback because then we know we're kind of on the right track um if if for whatever reason you're still struggling trying to sort of critique these labs um and this doesn't help it, again that would be good to know maybe maybe there's a certain very specific element of this that isn't working and then we can modify it and it is useful so it's always good to have that kind of feedback. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that before too much time went on because today is Tuesday and I think your lab becomes available tomorrow. So I just can, I, to can I add something real quick, Mark? Yeah, go for it. 
yeah, uh, I just want to make sure everyone realizes that not all of those sections like abstract, introduction, whatever should be weighted equally. So just because they have a terrible abstract doesn't mean you should give them like a five or six overall. <laughs> oh, yes, so that's, can... that's a very good point, Romain. You're absolutely right. I mean, the abstract is only at most 250 words, um, you know, maybe maybe even as short as like 100 words or, or like four or five sentences. So, you know, if, if there's a level one for the abstract, you know, there's no way four, four bad sentences should, should tank the grade, the overall grade for a lab. That's a very good point. Um, maybe, maybe I'll go back. Um, that's, that's a good point. I, I, I will try to sit down sometime today and maybe try to figure out like a waiting scheme and, and kind of re-upload a version of, of, this, uh, of this rubric. Yeah, thank, thanks for mentioning that. Okay, um, I don't think there are any other uh, question or any other things administratively that I want to mention. So without further ado, let's go back and let's uh, kind of pick up where we left off. Now, um, on Thursday's lecture, we moved on from the electric force, we moved on from Gauss's law, we moved on from the electric field, and we introduced or revisited, I guess, energy, the same sort of energy ideas that we visited in 136. And uh, we, we introduced the electrical potential energy. And there were two versions of that, um, if you recall. Uh, there was the Coulombic energy, the Coulombic electric energy. And this is the, the electrical potential energy between um, two point charges. Now they could be, you know, two positive charges or two negative charges, or they could be two oppositely charged particles, whatever. Um, point being the word Coulombic here, the word Coulombic specifically refers to point charges. And this electrical potential energy, E sub electric energy electric, is going to be K Q1 Q2 over R. And uh, here you can see, for instance, if you have two positive charges, then when you push them closer together, they don't naturally, like let's say we push this one really close to the second one. So their separation distance R is small and they don't want to be close together, right? They, they're, they're repelling each other. So if you're pushing them really close together, this is analogous, this is a similar, similar to compressing a spring. You know, a spring doesn't naturally want to be compressed. So if a spring is being compressed, you're storing energy in the spring in the same way that if two, if two like charges, either positive and positive or negative and negative, are being forced close together, what you're doing is you're storing energy in the system. And uh, the opposite is, is true. If you have oppositely charged particles, like a negative and a positive, um, they, they want to be close together, right? Just like when you drop a pen and it falls toward the ground or you drop any object and it falls toward the ground because of gravity. Um, you know, these two want to be close together. This is a similar idea to gravity in that the closer the two are, the less energy exists. So uh, in this case, the, the, if, if the positive charge were to end up being closer to the negative charge, just like um, the, 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 the previous scenario over here, um, again, if you look at the equation, um, as it gets closer, this would reduce the electrical energy, and then if it was farther away, then this would increase the energy. 
and the opposite is true uh, when you're when you're in this case. So um, I know electricity is kind of abstract, and electrostatics are kind of abstract because, um, and I've mentioned this in in the last Tuesday's lecture, the very first lecture of the semester, because uh, you can no longer touch and feel and experience uh, these sorts of ideas in Physics 137, and as as difficult as 136 may have felt for many of you. Um, I hope you can appreciate that at least the ideas in 136, many of them you could touch and feel. You know, if, if you're wondering about the motion of, 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 of a ball being thrown, you could always just throw the ball and then you could throw the ball many times in a row and just kind of watch it like a good scientist would. But when it comes to these sorts of ideas in electricity, you can't. You can't just, you know, hold two electrons apart and then watch what happens when you let them go. You know, you have to leave that up to your imagination and, and if you're lacking some prior knowledge or if you're lacking some even new knowledge that, that is being presented in the class, it's really hard for your imagination to imagine what would happen in real life because you can't see it. So hopefully by giving you these sort of these analogies to things from 136, you know, like comparing uh, two positive charges to compressing a spring and comparing a positive and negative to let's say gravity, hopefully these allow you to sort of uh, help you connect these abstract ideas to something more concrete. Uh, okay, so with that refresher, oh, sorry, there's one other refresher I want to say before we do this example that we left off at. Um, so that was Coulombic energy. Um, there is a general form of, um, let me say, if, if um, the, the electric force is not constant, we had to solve for the electrical potential energy with an integral. And you'll recall that what we did was, this is more specifically the electric force dx, you'll recall specifically we integrated Coulomb's law. And the integral of Coulomb's law, kqq over r squared, is kqq over r. Um, and yes, technically, if you integrate a 1 over r squared, you're going to get a negative out front. Um, for this level of class, you know, like for the, for the life science physics course, um, I'm not too concerned with the, the technicalities of when you integrate, you get a negative. Um, the way in which the negative is significant is you have to think about whether energy is being stored or energy is being released. And that, this, these ideas here um, handle the negative summing. So you need to ask yourself, if, if two protons are being pushed together, you're increasing the energy in the system. So you know whether to make that term positive or negative just by, just by thinking about whether energy is going up or going down. And if you have a positive and a negative that are going closer together, they want to go closer together. So they're reducing, like it's like uh, MGH, as, it, as H goes down, MGH goes down. So that tells you whether or not to, to make it positive or negative uh, accordingly. So uh, we'll do some examples well, now um, to kind of show you what that means. Now, in contrast to that, if the electric force is constant, which I will tell you now is very rare in real life, but luckily we are not in real life at the moment. We are in an idealized real life, i.e. first year physics. So if the electric force is constant, then we can say the work done is simply F times D. And the electric force specifically, we know is QE. So we see the work done due to a constant electric force would be QED. And this, this, of course, assumes that E is also constant. Okay, so this might occur in, say, something like a parallel plate capacitor, which we will revisit later in this lecture. Okay, so we have one example to do. Um, that we didn't get a chance to do last Tuesday, but I guess in hindsight, it's kind of a good thing we didn't get a chance to do it last Tuesday, or not last Tuesday, last Thursday, um, because it allows for, you know, a, a good sort of refresher of, of um, all the concepts we talked about last Thursday. So here's where we left off. 
The figure shows three point charges that are held in a fixed position by forces that are not shown. So maybe there's some duct tape there or something or some super glue that are, I'm being facetious, of course, you cannot duct tape some electrons, but you know what I mean, um, that are not shown. What is the electric potential energy, meaning what is the energy of the system um, uh, for this arrangement of charges? Now, what does that question even mean? Well, it means, if you look here carefully, we have a plus and a plus. Well, if left to their own devices and, and you don't adhere these charges in place, you do not fix them in place, um, if left to their own devices, those two charges would just repel each other and uh, wander away until they are an infinite distance away from each other because there's going to be a force of repulsion there. So those two positive charges do not want to stay in this exact situation. However, we are forcing them to stay in this exact situation in the same sense that we are, when we compress a spring, when a spring is compressed, there is a force, a constant force holding that spring compressed. Um, analogous is like when you want to um, shoot a rubber band at your friend because that's what you do with rubber bands. You know, when you, when you take aim, you, you elongate the rubber band and your muscles are, are imposing a constant force on that rubber band to keep it elongated. That rubber band doesn't want to be elongated on your on your fingers but as long as you're putting in a constant force on that rubber band it will remain elongated and as soon as you let go of the rubber band it flies off and if you've aimed it correctly which takes some physics it's a kinematics problem but anyway if you aimed it properly you can you know hit your friend with it now um, that's what's going on here those two positive charges do not want to stay this close together this is analogous to compressing a spring that takes energy to compress a spring. It takes energy to keep two positive charges close to one another because they don't want to be. The opposite is true for these negative charges and the positive charges. We have the, a negative charge here at the top of the triangle that is held uh, a, a distance away from a positive charge. Those two are attracting each other. If left to their own devices, that negative charge would snap right to the positive charge. Just like when I drop, drop an object, it, it smacks into the surface of the earth. They do not want to be apart. They want to be together. So it takes energy to keep them apart. It's like, you know, when you're walking your dog and your dog sees a squirrel, you know, you got to pull back to keep your dog from attacking the squirrel. You're, you're, that, that takes energy. So that's what this question is. It's how much energy does it take to make this system look exactly this way? Um, here, they're giving you specific values for, for the distance. They're saying 12 centimeters, um, you know, and they're, they're giving you magnitudes um, for, for the charges. Um, I, I don't really care about the number. I just, I'm more concerned with the setup of the problem and showing students kind of how, how to approach this conceptually. So here's how you go about doing it. We look at the work done on the system. So we look at... Oh, let me let me use black here now that I'm not writing on a black slide. Um, we have to calculate how much work is needed to assemble these three charges in this exact fashion. How do we do that? Well, we do that how we would any other energy problem. We say before anything happened, in this specific instance, before anything happened, these charges were infinitely far away from one another. So picture these charges infinitely far away from one another. They're, they're on opposite ends of our universe, let's say. They're so far away from one another that their energies are zero. And in order to find out how much energy is in the system, we have to think or calculate how much energy does it take to systematically assemble this, this arrangement of, of charges. So the way we do that is we, we systematically one by one start building our our system or start building our final product 
So for instance, I might say, well, actually, let, let me write this equation down. The work done to total, the total work done in the system is going to be the work done to move charge one in, into place, plus the work done to move charge two into place, plus the work done to move charge three into place. So let's do that now. Let's say, where is charge one? Charge one is positive. It's the bottom left corner. So let's say this. Let's move this. I don't know what path we're moving it along, so it's going to be a squiggly path. And let's say we are now moving charge one into place from an infinitely far away distance. Okay, well, what is the amount of work it takes to move a charged particle? Well, in general, the work to move a charged particle is the integral of the electric force dx. Okay, so it, it's based on the electric force. We know we've got two options. The electric force is either constant or the electric force is not constant. So we ask ourselves, in the scenario for number one, for moving the charge one, what is the external electric force? Well, we know this, the external electric force is QE. So what's the external electric field when we're moving charge one? Well, it's zero because nothing, nothing is in place yet. What's the, what's the electric field in this region? before we move charge one, it's zero. There's nothing there to produce an electric, an electric field. So the electric force is, is Q times zero. So there's no electric force, which means moving the first one into place takes no work. Now, if, if you have trouble thinking of that, another way to, to contemplate this is you can just arbitrarily designate that wherever Q1 happens to be, we can say that's, that's, it's, it's, that's where it's supposed to be, and we'll move the other two charges in around Q1, wherever Q1 happens to be. So there's sort of two ways to look at that. Okay, so the first one's a freebie. The second one, the second one looks to be the negative charge. So the second one, let's move the second one into place. Again, through a wonky path, we don't know the path. It's not necessarily a straight line. This is Q2. However, what's different this time is as we're moving Q1 into place, we now actually have an existing, ooh, I don't know what happened there. We now have a Q1 that is already in place that is generating an electric field. So as you're moving Q2 in from an infinitely far distance away, as you're moving Q2 in, you are actually fighting some sort of electric force. Now, we notice here that this is a force of attraction, negative and positive charges, which means if left to your own devices, Q, uh, Q2 would snap in a, in a beeline straight for Q1, and it, it, would, it would keep accelerating as it gets closer and closer and closer, because um, it would be using its, its electrical potential energy and transforming that into kinetic energy. And as it gets closer and closer and closer, it's using up more and more and more of its electrical potential energy, meaning more and more and more of it gets transferred into, um, into um, uh, uh, kinetic energy. So that's what would happen if we weren't involved. We are involved and we are forcing this, uh, this, this charged particle Q2 to be in a very specific location. Specifically, um, according to the diagram, let me just get rid of all these other arrows, a distance D away. And we're holding it there. This is analogous to your dog uh, seeing a squirrel and, and launching after the squirrel, and you're doing all your, your, your squatting, you're digging your heels into the ground to pull backwards on your dog. You're putting energy into the leash to keep your dog right where your dog is and, and preventing your dog from running after the, the squirrel. So that's what we're having to calculate. So um, for number two, for the work done to bring charge two into this, um, we have to first ask ourselves, what kind of force are we fighting? It's the Coulombic force. So we know the Coulombic force is KQQ over R squared. So we need the associated Coulombic energy. The associated Coulombic energy, as we know, 
is KQQ over R. So this is going to be KQ1, Q2 over um, R. R in this case is, is D. Now, we're having to put energy um, into the system, right? This, this is, this is uh, we're having to pull backwards, right? So this is going to be a negative quantity, okay? Because um, this wants to be close together. We're the one taking it apart. So um, this is going to be a negative amount of work done. So um, that's, that's the value for, for WQ2. And then two of the three charges are in place. And we now need a fourth one, not a fourth, a third one. So we move the third one in place. And it's positive, and this is going to be labeled as Q3. And it's a distance D away from Q1, and it's a distance D away from Q2. Now, this is a little bit more tricky because, again, we're having to fight the existing electric field that's already in place. That's how you find the work done, F equals QE and work equals the integral of f dx. Here, there is more than one contribution for e. We have two contributions for e. So we have to additively um, figure out what the net e field is. Now, the beautiful part about energy is energy is a scalar, not a vector. Force is a vector. So the beautiful part about not using forces uh, in this instance, and the beautiful part about using energy is energy is just added together like a scalar. You don't have to worry about vectors. You don't have to worry about direction. So here, we simply say the work done to move Q3 into place is going to be the work done to move Q3 into place because of Q1's presence, plus the work done to move Q3 into place due to Q2's presence, because there's two sources of electric field. And here, we say this is going to be it's coulombic between Q3 and Q1. And Q3 and Q1, uh, we're putting energy into the system because we're compressing a spring. So this is going to be a positive value, K, Q1, Q3 over D. We're compressing that spring. Uh, if you're compressing a spring, you're storing energy in the system to use for later. Um, however, with um, Q3 and Q2, we have a positive and we have a negative, so um, we're releasing energy from the spring, right? The, the, the spring wants to snap together. We're the ones pulling it apart. So this is going to be a negative, and this is going to be K, Q, what is it, 2, Q3 over D. So overall, um, if we're adding everything, work done total is going to be 0 plus negative k q1 q2 over d plus k q1 q3 over d minus k q2 q3 over d so this is going to be the work done to move q1 into place the work done to move q2 into place and the work done to move q3 into place and then if we add all these up uh, we're going to get, uh, let's see, what can we factor out? We can factor out a K, we can factor out a D, and we're left with negative Q1, Q2 plus Q1, Q3 minus Q2, Q3. And we know a little bit about Q1, Q2, and Q3. What do we know? Let's go back here. Um, Q2, Q2 is four times Q1, and Q3 is two times Q1. Okay, so here, this is going to be um, Q, um, Q2 is what, four Q, plus Q, Q3 was two Q, and this was Q2 was what, two Q, Q3 was four Q. Notice here that I'm not dealing with the negative signs. This is what I was saying before. I know technically blah, 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 negative sign, positive sign. You're accounting for the negative signs ahead of time when you set up your equation. 
right? I'm thinking to myself conceptually, am I compressing a spring or am I preventing this from falling? When you, when you do that and you set up your equations in advance, you are assigning the negatives in advance. And then that way, when you plug your values in, you can just plug them in magnitude wise. You don't have to worry about is this charge positive or negative. You're already accounting for the positive and negative aspects when you're setting up your equation. So if we go through with this, oh, I'm still writing in blue. Um, we're gonna have K Q squared over D. And this is gonna be negative four plus two minus eight. And this is gonna be minus 10 K Q squared over D. So overall, this is gonna take a negative amount of work. What does it mean to take a negative amount of work? It means if left to your own devices, you're not compressing a spring. If you leave, just keep this in mind, minus 10 K Q squared over D, or rather just keep the fact that it's negative in mind. If we go back to the picture here, the fact that it's negative, or our answer is negative, that means if we leave everything to its own devices, you're gonna get these three objects, and if you just let them go, they're just gonna go and, and snap together. Like when you let go of a rubber band, it's just gonna snap together. That's what the negative means. It means you actually have to be pulling away to keep these things apart. If we did the math, like let's say we fiddle with the magnitudes, um, you know, here we had a minus four Q2. What if we, what if that was a smaller number, like just negative Q? And let's say Q3 here was really large, like 10 Q. Well, then the, the answer would be a positive value. And what that would result in is us having to be pushing inwards to keep them together. Like when you're pushing inwards on a spring to compress the spring. So that's how you can uh, conceptually interpret the, the sign of the answer. A positive answer for work done means you're having to push inwards to keep them together. A negative answer means you're having to pull outwards to keep them together. Like, you know, the, the negative sign, I guess, in my previous analogy, I will say means you are having to pull your dog's leash to prevent dog from eating squirrel. So that's what that negative means. Okay, so um, there we go. There's the answer there. Uh, there's a bit of a typo here. There should be a negative there. Um, clearly, when I crunched my numbers, I, I did not carry through my mistake because there's, there's a negative sign in the answer. So um, there should be a negative there in that answer. That was my typo. Okay, so that's sort of the end of the um, traditional energy ideas from 136. Um, in Physics 137, we have a new notion that is not present in 136. And this notion is just simply called electric potential. Not electric potential energy, but electric potential. And that's a very confusing term. Um, so most people just call it voltage. So let's talk about what voltage is and why we even talk about it. So you'll notice that the Coulombic energy is still in terms of two variables, right? Charge, Q1 and Q2. We did not really see this in 136. Like the energy for things really were only a, a function of one object. Kinetic energy, one half mv squared. All the variables in there are for one object. It's the mass of one object and it's the speed of the same object. MGH for mg delta h. It's, it's all the variables in mg delta h. Yes, there are two variables, but both variables are, are quantities for the same object. It's, it's only knowledge of one object. The spring, one half kx squared. Yes, there are two variables, but both variables represent values from the same individual spring. It's the spring constant for that spring and the elongation of that same spring or compression of the same spring. 
The, the electrical potential energy, however, we require knowledge of two separate objects. Yes, it's still two variables, I understand this, but it's two variables from different objects. And this is just not optimal. It's not impossible to deal with, it's just not optimal. Um, it would be really handy to sort of be able to predict behavior based on a source. And we sort of have the same idea that we had before when we introduced the notion of F equals QE. We understood that the electric force took two to tango. You can only have an electric force when there's, an, when there's another charged object in and around the, the vicinity. However, we understood that this electric force um, came in all shape, different shapes and sizes. It, it, it depends whether you have two point sources, it depends whether you have two parallel plates, it depends if you have one parallel plate and a charge, you know. So we invented this idea that says, okay, assuming we have one charge that we know about, what kind of force will this feel, assuming we have knowledge of everything else that we need? whether it be knowledge of another individual point source or knowledge of a plate or knowledge of two plates or whatever, okay? We sort of passed the buck. We passed the problem onto a different variable. That's what we're doing here. It would be helpful to know whether, maybe not the, the magnitude of the energy, but it would be helpful to know, like, you know when I raise a pencil and I drop it? I don't need to know the mass of the earth precisely. I know if I drop the pencil, it will fall because the, the pencil wants to go to a lower amount of energy. That's what I want to know here. I don't, I don't want to always, always, always have to have a, a piece of knowledge from a second object to know what's higher and lower energy. I don't want to always know knowledge of two objects to know where is lower and where is higher. That's what voltage is. Voltage is just saying, what is energy without the knowledge of the other guy? So I will say, the electrical energy is analogous to the force and uh, the voltage difference is analogous to the electric field, right? In the sense that this takes two objects and this only takes one object. Okay, so we invented the electric field to eliminate knowledge of one, one object and we invented voltage to eliminate knowledge of one object. So the motivation is the same for both quantities. So let's look at kind of how voltage is defined. So the very basic definition of voltage, it does not get more defi definition-y than what I have outlined in red. The basic definition of voltage is the electrical potential energy divided by uh, a secondary charge Q. So if you look at this for a Coulombic, Coulombic energy, we see that this is going to be K Q of the source Q2 over R. So we say voltage is going to equal the electrical potential energy divided by the secondary the secondary object. And this is going to be equal to KQ of the source Q2 over D, or no, over R, sorry, over R times Q2. We see here how the two Q2s cancel, and then we get KQ of the source over R. This is, uh, in essence, I know it's not a joule because it's not energy because we've canceled something, but it's close to a joule. We've all we've done is we've eliminated our knowledge or our need for a second object. And this now is only a function of one object. So this is the very definition of voltage. Now, in the event that we have a constant E field, which Coulombic E fields are not constant E fields. So please don't, be, don't, don't go do this with, um, with Coulombic E fields. But parallel plate capacitors, for instance, do have a constant E field, um, among other handfuls of situations. In the event we do have a constant E field, 
you can actually say that the voltage difference, meaning V2 minus V1, in the same way you would say the difference in gravitational potential energy, EG2 minus EG1, or EG prime minus EG, um, the difference in potential energy is going to be equal to the electric fields times the displacement, the displacement meaning position 2 minus position 1. So technically there's a delta on both sides. Now, uh, I've already sort of mentioned this. Um, if you recall from 136, let me change to black, the gravitational potential energy, for instance, is relative. And what do I mean by this? If we had an object that sits at the center of a table, that's a terribly drawn table. I'm going to label it table. If we had an object that sits at the middle of a table, actually looking at that table, it's going to be really tippy. If you think of torque from 136, you know, the, the bases are really close together and there's a lot of, there's a big lever arm on either side. I'm sorry, I'm a physics nerd. Anyway, um, if you have if you have an object at the center of the table, your brain is sort of tricked into thinking that it has no gravitational potential energy because the object is safely resting in the center of the table and has no risk of falling. So you think, oh, the, the gravitational potential energy of that object, you might think, you might think is zero because it has no risk of falling. It, it can't go down anymore. H is zero. However, if I conveniently move that object to the edge of the table, I haven't really changed its altitude at all. H is not different. But now all of a sudden, like let's say that object was your expensive thousand dollar or more iPhone. And let's say this table was like the CN Tower. You know, that's a long way down. And you might be nervous placing your phone on the, on the railing of, the, uh, of, a, of a balcony or even on a condo building or something like that. You might be nervous because now your brain sees that it has a risk of falling. And now your brain is sort of worried about this sort of non-zero delta H. So now all of a sudden your brain's like, oh yeah, now it, has, now it has a lot of gravitational potential energy. But we haven't done any work on the system. We have not changed the altitude of this object. So how do you just create energy from nothing? Well, we didn't. My point is that the gravitational potential energy is relative. It depends on your frame of reference. It depends where you want to call zero. If you want to call the table zero, that's cool. That just means when you drop this object off the side of the building, it has negative gravitational potential energy because it's, it's below zero. It's below the altitude of where you have called zero. All along, what you could have done, all along, you could have called this equal to zero. And then uh, even though your, your phone is in the center of the table and it has no risk of falling, all you have to do is sort of like push yourself back from the table a little bit and let your brain see that there's a distance below the table. And then you can say, oh, look, even though it can't fall, it's still, it's still one meter above the ground. Um, and, if, if you want something more concrete, you can think of, let's say, when you're like wandering around the university buildings, you know, like if, if you're, let's say you're from UTM, if you're on, on the main floor of the Davis building where the Tim Hortons is and the food court, um, you'd think you're on ground level, right? Because you walked in from the bus stop, you walked in from outside, outside is ground level, and the, the main floor of Davis is ground level. You're thinking, great, I have zero potential energy. However, there are actually two floors below ground level. Ground level, for some reason, is floor two. And then there's floor one, which is where the physics labs are in. And then there's floor zero, which is where the gym is on. So um, you, that sort of illustrates how your brain can be tricked into thinking you have no potential energy and how uh, potential energy is, is relative. So I just want to show you voltage is also relative, right? Because it's electrical potential energy divided by Q. Q is Q. Q is not relative, right? Something objectively has a certain amount of charge on it. But electrical potential energy, again, is potential energy. It's, it's a relative quantity. It depends where you want to define your zero to be. So that means voltage is also relative. You have a relative quantity. You have a relative quantity 
uh, being divided by something absolute. So that's going to give you a relative quantity. So voltage is also relative. It is impossible to say uh, your phone on the table absolutely has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy. All you can say is your phone has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy relative to the floor, or it has a certain amount of gravitational potential energy relative to the top of the table. Same thing with electricity. You cannot say, oh, the voltage is blah, blah, blah. Relative to what? You need a, a sort of frame of reference. So because of this, we often just simply sidestep the problem, and we, we often just talk about the voltage difference or the potential difference between two points. The potential difference is, is not relative at all. If you want to say, you know, I, my phone is on the, on the ground and I raise my phone up to the table. Well, what was the initial energy before? I don't know. It was on the ground. You might want to call that zero. Someone else in your class might say, oh, well, the ground is level two and there are two levels below that. So the initial may not be zero. It doesn't matter. All that matters is if it was raised one meter to the tabletop, then the difference in energy is mg times one meter, right? So that's what we're doing here with electricity as well. We are often talking about the potential difference, the change in voltage. So now that we've sort of uh, motivated the idea to ignore V, but only talk about delta V, now we have to sort of use our science brains to figure out why is this important? What are the consequences of this quantity? What happens, for instance, when delta V is positive? Or what happens when it's negative? So in fact, the sign of the potential difference is responsible for predicting motion for a charged particle. So let's see why. Let's assume for a second um, the potential energy is, say, negative. Okay, so not, sorry, not potential energy. Let's assume the potential difference is, is negative. So position one has a higher voltage than position two. Position two has a lower voltage. What does that mean? Well, we know voltage is um, the electrical potential energy divided by Q. So it's the electrical potential energy at position two divided by Q minus the electrical potential energy at one divided by Q. And we're assuming that that subtraction is less than zero. Okay, well, mathematically, we can easily just cancel the Qs because we have zero on the right hand side. So we can just multiply by Q and cancel that. And then we are obtained with this. The energy at position two is less than the energy uh, at position or minus one is less than zero. So we conclude this, the energy at position two is less than the energy at position one. Well, we know from 136 that a force, a naturally occurring force, is actually the negative derivative of energy. Um, and we've seen this, you know, like for instance, the energy of a spring is one half kx squared. So what's the derivative of one half kx squared? Well, the derivative of one half kx squared with respect to x, with the negative in front, is going to be negative 2 over 2 kx to the 2 minus 1, which is simply uh, k minus kx, which is exactly Hooke's law, the spring force. So we know um, this, this mathematically tells us that forces, forces act to reduce energy. That's what the negative derivative means. If you recall from calculus, uh, when you want to do optimization or you want to find local max and local min, um, you, you optimize. You take the derivative, you set it equal to zero. Well, the derivative is the instantaneous rate of change. If you want to minimize, you, want to, you don't want to go up. You don't want to, you don't want to maximize your rate of change. You want to minimize. You want to take the negative derivative. 
So that's what we're doing here. Um, forces will act in such a way that opposes a, a, an increase in energy, and that means it'll decrease energy. So if position two has a lesser energy than position one, then that means there will be a force pushing the particle towards position two. This means a positive charge will spontaneously feel a force which will cause that charge to flow to naturally flow to a lower energy. And this is what we use potential difference for. We say Q, a positive charge will naturally flow towards a lower voltage. So in a question or even in real life, um, if, if, if the potential difference is negative, then a charge will, a positive charge will naturally flow in that direction. Now, of course, when you have a negative charge, all the physics is just reversed. It, it's all the same physics. It's just all the signs of everything is reversed because instead of a positive Q, you have a negative Q. So everything's just reversed. We've already established that a positive charge will flow toward a, a lower potential. So that means a negative charge will naturally flow towards a higher potential. Um, I know that seems kind of weird to think about, kind of like a ball naturally rolling up a hill, but you have to remember a ball is not rolling up a hill. The force is literally opposite. There is, there is a force pushing the, the uh, negative charge in the opposite direction be because it's an oppositely charged particle. It's not a positive charged particle. So it's not that the ball is actually rolling up the hill. There's, there's no weird physics happening there. It, it's, it's the, it is still rolling down a hill. It's just, what is uphill for a positive charge is downhill for a negative charge. Okay, um, the other thing uh, to take away here is when the potential difference or when, when, the, when the voltage difference is non-zero, there will be motion for charges. Now, not, that statement doesn't necessarily say positive or negative. It just says when the potential difference is non-zero, there will be a current, there will be a flow of charge. Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, Coulombic voltage, for instance. So here's an example. What is the voltage that um, Q1, which is a plus one charge, feels due to the source of Q2? Well, we know the Coulombic voltage is going to be KQ of the source over the separation distance, D. So the source voltage here due to, due to the red charge. So the source is the red charge. So this is going to be K times 2 over D. So the answer here is going to be 2K over D. So that's pretty simple. Um, I'm just kind of illustrating kind of how you would use that in context. Um, so here's a, a very brief summary of, of specifically Coulombic voltage, not necessarily general voltage, but specifically Coulombic voltage right here. Um, the summary is that the Coulombic voltage is specifically the voltage due to a single point charge it is given by the formula V equals KQ over R. If you have multiple point charges, you simply add the individual voltages together. And the nice part is it is a scalar quantity, not a vector quantity. So you do not need a free body diagram or components or anything like that. So here's a for instance. What is, oh, sorry, my zoom is acting weird. There we go. What is the potential at point A? Uh, point A is up here. Let me just maybe not draw it in black, maybe draw it in red. So here's point A up here. We have two charges. We have um, a charge down here. We have positive 50 microcoulombs. And we have another charge over here. We've got negative 50 microcoulombs. And um, it's a coulombic voltage and we've got two sources. So as I said in the previous slide, the way you deal with this is you simply add um, the, the individual contributions. So we say the voltage is gonna be the voltage due to Q2 plus the voltage due to Q1. And this is gonna be KQ2 over 30 centimeters. 
right? Because the distance here is 30 centimeters. Um, and this is a negative voltage, right? Because it's a negative source. So minus K um, Q1 over 60 centimeters. And the magnitudes are both the same. They're both 50 microcoulombs. One's positive and one's negative. So if I simplify this, this is going to be K times 50 microcoulombs over 30 centimeters times one minus a half, right? Because 30 is twice as small as 60. Um, so when you, when you do this and simplify, you're going to get K times 50 microcoulombs over two times 30 centimeters. And more specifically, this is a positive value. You can see after the subtraction, it's positive. Um, so the answer here is whatever the voltage is, it's going to be positive. And an easy way to sort of conclude that is you have the same magnitude of charge, one's positive, one's negative, but the negative one is farther away. So they're not going to perfectly cancel out because one is farther away. Um, however, if we were asked, if we were asked about point B, for instance, I know we weren't, but let's say we were, if we were asked at point B, um, 26 and 26, this is an equilateral triangle or isosceles, isosceles triangle. So the positive charge is the same distance away from point B as the negative charge is. And they have the same magnitude of charge, just opposite direction. So if we were asking about point B, then I'll say if we were interested in point B, then the voltage would be equal to zero. Now, just to clear something up for you, just because the voltage equals zero does not mean the electric field is equal to zero. So let me write that down, maybe in a different color. However, is the electric field equal to zero as well? Well, let's take a look here. Let's draw a free body diagram. The electric field at point B due to Q1 would be in this direction. This is the electric field due to Q1. Maybe I'll put a vector here to show you it's not energy. And then this is a positive charge, so it pushes away. Maybe I'll draw this in a different color. So the electric field will push away. The electric field due to Q2 vector. So you see here that when you add the net uh, E field vector, these two will not sum to zero. They will in fact sum to something that looks like this. So although the, although the, the voltage is equal to zero, uh, we see here that the electric field is not equal to zero. All right, so please be careful. Voltage is a scaled version of energy. E is analogous to a force. It is absolutely possible for an object to have, let's say, zero kinetic energy at a certain moment in time, i.e. the object is not moving, but it is absolutely possible for there to be a force on that object. For instance, you're at a red light, your car is stopped, the light turns green, and your car accelerates. Well, just before that, there was no kinetic energy, yet it started moving, so there was a force on it. Same thing here. It is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely possible for the voltage to be zero at a certain point, but the electric field is non-zero. Okay. Uh, more examples, because I think the more examples we do, the, the better conceptually uh, this will make sense. So which of the following configurations gives a net voltage of, oh, you can't see green on black very well, uh, it gives a voltage of zero at, at all points along the x-axis. So again, don't think about vectors. We're thinking about voltage. Voltage is just simply scalar addition. So here, 
for instance, um, we will have a positive contribution of voltage from here, a negative contribution of voltage from here. Those will perfectly cancel out. And we will have a positive contribution of voltage from here and a negative contribution from voltage here. Same magnitude, same, uh, same magnitude, opposite sign, same distance, so those will cancel out. So it looks like um, this one will cancel. Um, here, for instance, it won't. Here, we have a positive contribution of voltage uh, at specifically at this location. Uh, here, we have a negative contribution, but with a different magnitude. So at the blue here, at the blue dot, we will automatically not have a zero voltage. So this, this that one I know is, is, is just not going to happen. And um, the same is true uh, for this one, because it's the same start. So the answer is, is just the first one. Now, this question would be totally different if I was asking you for uh, which scenario had the net E field equal to zero along the X axis. That would be uh, a vector question as well as a magnitude question and that, that becomes much more complicated. So this question illustrates that voltage is a scalar, okay, not a vector. All right, now we've done a lot of work, no pun intended, on um, talking about uh, voltage in the context of Coulombic, like two point charges. So let's just revisit um, sort of Coulombic voltage, or sorry, um, voltage notions, but not in the context of Coulomb, uh, perhaps in the context of something more arbitrary, like, like a parallel plate capacitor, for instance, because we've already talked about a parallel plate capacitor. So um, we could ask, how much, how much work does it take to move a charge within an electric field? Well, sorry, within a constant uh, electric field. We already know that the work done in a constant electric field is simply given not by the integral, but simply by force times uh, displacement. And if it's the electric force doing the moving, then the electric force is QE times the displacement, which is QED, if I drop the brackets. However, uh, I, I gave you a little sort of snapshot of a previous slide that we were talking about. Um, in the context of a constant electric field, then the potential difference is in fact given by E times D. So I can actually sort of replace E times D with voltage. Now, this equation is actually true. I know I derived this equation using a constant E field, However, this equation is true. Uh, oops, I meant to do that in a different color. This equation is actually true not only for a constant E field, but for all cases. This equation is much harder to derive arbitrarily. It's much harder to derive if I don't make the assumption that E was, was constant. So showing you the derivation in the context of E being constant is only because we're in first year. And I don't wanna be showing you some complicated integrating and calculus, but hopefully this result, I mean, this result was one or two lines, right? Um, when E is constant. So hopefully that, that gives you some context to where work equals Q delta V comes from and please understand there is a way to show this generally, but it is much easier to show the derivation when, when E is constant. But this equation here is always, always true for any E field. Okay. So this allows us to sort of, uh, simply calculate the work done on objects, uh, charged objects, I should say, um, as long as we know sort of uh, the potential difference that charge felt. So here's an example. Which two points 
in this diagram have the same electric potential, the same voltage. Now the source here, the source here is just a, a point charge and it's red, so it's, it's gonna be positive, not that that matters in this question. And so the, the mere fact that it's a, it's a point charge, we know the voltage is given by KQ over R. Now, assuming it's a, a, a fixed point charge, capital Q, the only variable really in this diagram is R. So which two points, A, B, C, D, or E, have the same voltage, which means which two points have the same radius? Well, I can see here E and C are at the same radii apart from Q. Although they're in different locations, they're the same radial distance away from Q. D is farther away, and, and if you look along the circle for D, there's nothing else on that orbit with D. B, same thing, there's nothing else on that same orbit with B, and A is just way out in left field. A has just left the building, it's not even in an orbit. So the answer here is going to be C and E. Which one is that? It's D. <laughs> C and E, the answer is D. That's funny. Okay, so maybe the answer is four if you don't want to get confused. So there you go. Okay, um, here is another example with using uh, work done and voltage, uh, but not necessarily in the context of Coulombic, uh, Coulombic sources. So this is a uniform E field. Uh, which of the following paths, path one, path two, path three, or path four, uh, requires um, the most amount of work, assuming you're moving a positive test charge. So if you have a pos uh, red is positive because all textbooks show protons as, as red. I, I don't know, I find that just the funniest thing about physics books. It's like protons are red and electrons are blue. Chemistry books too, I just find that funny. Um, anyway, so let's look. We know the work done is Q times delta V. Well, we know a positive charge will naturally flow to a lower potential. Naturally flow, meaning we don't have to do anything. So which one requires the most work to move? If it naturally wants to move in a direction, I don't have to do anything. It'll just move there on its own. That's the easiest. So which one takes the most work? Well, let's look at this. The electric field lines are pointing to the right. The electric field lines are the direction in which a positive charge will, will spontaneously move, meaning this has a lower voltage and this is a higher voltage because the positive charge will spontaneously move in the direction of the field lines. And we know a positive test charge will also spontaneously move to a lower potential. So the lower potentials on the right hand side, the higher potentials on the left hand side. So the answer is not four, because four uh, will spontaneously move. If, if anything, I actually have to pull it backwards to keep it in place. So this takes a, a number four, takes a negative amount of work. That's definitely not the most. Um, three, three, path, let's, let's go backwards, path three. Well, path, path the three, uh, we have to look at the work done. The work done is a function of the change in voltage. Well, the left side is high, the right side is low. I'm not moving left or right, I'm moving straight upwards. So what is my change in voltage if I'm moving straight upwards? Zero, right? Left is high, right is low. I'm not moving left or right, I'm moving straight up. So my change in voltage for number three, my change in voltage is zero. Therefore, my work done is equal to zero. So hopefully zero is not the maximum, but let's see. Two, path two, I am swim, I'm a salmon swimming upstream. Naturally, I will want to go downstream. 
if I just sit there like a dead fish and float in the water, I will go downstream to a lower potential. But path two says I'm swimming partially upstream. Again, the work is Q delta V. The larger the potential difference, the more the work is required. Now, although I'm swimming upstream, because I'm swimming upstream on an angle, part of my motion is um, directly upwards, and part of my motion is directly to the right, or sorry, directly to the left. So only a small component of my motion is upstream. It looks like a lot of my component is perpendicular to the flow. That takes no work because there's no change in, uh, in voltage there. It's only my upstream direction that has a change in voltage. So number two, has a non-zero voltage, so it'll have a, a non-zero positive work. Because I'm going upstream. My, my voltage is getting higher. I am, I am slowly walking toward a higher potential, which means uh, positive work. I'm compressing the spring, so to speak. However, path one, path one, by far, 100% of my motion for path one is in the direction of upstream. Every step that I take is upstream, which means I will go farther upstream if I follow path one than if I follow path two, which means, oh, I forgot to say two here. If I follow path one, um, not only is, is the change of potential non-zero, the change in potential for one is actually larger than the change in potential for path two, which means the work done for path one is larger than the work done for path two. So it takes the most work to follow path one. Now, that was a long convoluted way of concluding this using physics. I will try to make this as intuitive as possible, okay? I use the example of salmon swimming upstream. If you can't picture yourself as a salmon, then picture yourself. You know, we've all been in some sort of ocean, or not ocean, uh, some sort of water flow, whether it be the lazy river, whether it be an actual creek or river. Um, you know, we, we've, all, we've all been in, in water that has had a current in it. And if you float, then obviously you naturally go downstream. It's, it's less effort, you just kind of sit there. But if you want to walk upstream, it's really hard. You know, every step you take, you feel like you're, you're battling with the water, because you, you, I guess in physics, you kind of are. So that's what's happening here. Use your intuition. Um, a, a common theme throughout this entire class, and I'll tell you now, is uh, charges and how they flow, and electricity and how electricity flows, is perfectly analogous to fluid dynamics. And I know that word scares you, so just to put it in a, an even simpler term, it's perfectly analogous to water flowing. Picture water flowing out of your hose, turning on a sink, falling down a drain. Okay, if you're ever wondering what happens in electricity or you're getting confused conceptually, think about how water flows and your own experience with water. And I, I, like 99.999% of the time, it is exactly the same. So especially at a first year level. So when in doubt conceptually, think of, of particles or objects floating in water. And, and that should help you uh, regain your footing. Yeah, so the answer to this is, is number one. Okay, so um, back to parallel plates. I've been sort of dancing around this. Back to parallel plates. Um, I showed you in a previous slide that V2 minus V1 equals ED, or another way to say that is delta V equals ED. Now, this is true only for a constant electric field. One example of a constant electric field that in fact is actually very indicative of reality, there are very few constant fields in reality, but the, the parallel plate capacitor is a very commonly used object that, um, that has a constant E field in it. So if we are specifically talking about, let's say a parallel plate capacitor, then we can say this is not only constant, but also the E field of a capacitor, for instance. There are other situations where E fields are constant, but let's, let's say this one here. Um, then 
if we solve, what am I using green? And then if we solve, we're gonna get delta V over D. So the electric field in a capacitor is given by delta V over D, where D is the separation of, I don't know why the line goes all squiggly, where D is the separation of the plates. You might be asking yourself, well, we, we came up with the electric field inside a capacitor uh, on Wednesday, I believe. Maybe it was Thursday, I can't remember. Um, and this was the equation we got. And if you recall specifically, it took us like four or six hours of lecture to get to that equation. We talked about charge, we talked about charge transfer, we talked about the idea that, hey, we're recognizing there's an electric force, how do we find it? We introduced an E field, we introduced Gauss's law, and then we did Coulomb's law, and then we did capacitors. Right? It took an incredible amount of time to get to this equation. And here I am, I just sort of fell, so to speak, uh, on, on this equation. And you're like, well, that was so much easier, Mark. Why didn't we just do this first? Well, for one, we needed to, to do forces first because energy comes after forces and voltage is a modification on energy. I know you're not gonna be happy with that answer. Um, maybe a more acceptable answer is why didn't we do this one first? You'll notice it, there are com a completely disjoint set of variables. Completely disjoint, right? This one here has the charge on the plates, the, the material that the object is in, whether it be air, epsilon naught is like a vacuum or air. Um, if, if we made this out of plastic or styrofoam, it wouldn't be epsilon naught, it would be something else. And, and how big the plates are, the area of the plates. And the equation we just derived is, yes, it has a plate separation in it, but it also has a variable delta V. And then I could ask you, what is delta V of the plates? Well, you have no idea. So it really boils down to, because the only overlap really are the E values, both equations are totally valid. Okay, totally valid equations. Um, it's the same E field in both cases. It's just, there's a different set of variables that go in to calculating it. And you use whichever equation is more helpful given what you know about your setup. So I guess what I'm saying here is E vector equals E vector, which means delta V over D equals Q over epsilon naught A. So if I gave you the charge on the plates and the area of the plates and the separation of the plates, you should be able to find the voltage difference across the two plates. Let's say, Let's say we had a 12 volt battery that was connected to the plates in a circuit. I know we haven't talked about circuits yet, but let's say we had a 12 volt battery connected to, the, uh, to each end of the plate. In this case, I know the potential difference is 12 volts because it's literally hooked up to a battery forcing it to be 12 volts. And I could measure the distance between the plates with a ruler. I could measure the area with a ruler and a calculator. So I could reverse engineer how many coulombs of charge are on the plates. Okay, so both of these equations are totally valid, but the variables that go into those equations are mutually exclusive, which is actually really useful. Because then with a little piece of information of the puzzle on one end, you can solve for variables on the other end. Very nice that way. So let's solidify some of these new ideas by doing like an actual numerical problem. An infinite conducting sheet has a, ch a known charge of Q equals 5.8 picocoulombs per square meter. How much work, oh, infinite sheet. Okay, so let's, let's draw that. So there's an infinite sheet. It has a bunch of charges on it. 
In fact, it is in inherently impossible to draw an infinite sheet. I know what I've just drawn is a finite sheet, but pretend it's infinite. I literally cannot draw an infinite sheet. Um, and there's a certain charge density, 5.8 picocoulombs per square meter. How much work is done by the resulting electric field if there is a particle, it's positive, so I'm gonna draw it to be red. If there is a particle that has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, I believe that's the charge of an electron, or I guess proton because it's positive, uh, is moved from the surface of the sheet to a point, to a point P, a, a distance, Oh, sorry, a distance D equals 3.56 centimeters uh, from the surface of the sheet. So that first we're asked for what was it, how much work is done. B, if the electric potential, oh, I guess I should write that down, how much work is done. B, if the electric potential is defined to be zero at the surface of the sheet, and remember electric potential is relative, so it needs a frame of reference. We can define zero to be anywhere we want. So if we, if we are defining zero to be at the, sh at the surface of the sheet, what would the, what the resulting voltage then be a distance um, D away from the sheet? Okay, so um, what do we do? Well, the work done, or let me circle voltage, and then we say voltage equals question mark. Okay, so part A is we want to know the work done. We'll recall the work done is going to be uh, QED or Q delta V. Either way, we need to know either voltage or E field. Okay, so we don't know the E field of an infinite plate. Now, here's one of my hints. An infinite, uh, one single infinite sheet is not the same as a parallel plate capacitor. So this problem I added here to sort of revisit some of our ideas from last Wednesday, i.e. Gauss's law. Here's the story, if you recall. If we need the E field for a new situation, the weirdness about uh, electricity and magnetism, or I guess in this case specifically electricity, the weirdness is it's not one size fits all. There is no one single formula for the E field that is just universally applicable, right? There's the Coulombic E field, which we've looked at, KQ, Q over R, sorry, KQ over R squared. Then there was the E field of a parallel plate capacitor, Q over epsilon naught A. But here, we don't have a parallel plate capacitor and we don't have a point charge. It's, it's a third situation um, new that we haven't seen before. So let's fall back on Gauss's law. So step one is to find the formula for the E field. Well, if you recall my steps with Gauss's law, First, we have to sort of conceptually determine the structure of the E field. So we know we have a bunch of charges. And right now I'm looking at the, the infinite sheet sort of um, uh, from the side. So the infinite sheet is going into the page and coming out of the page at me, but it is not extending left or right. It's literally like looking at a sheet of paper, you know, like if you can see the camera, you're, you're literally looking at a sheet of paper kind of like this, dead on right from the side. Okay, so here, what's happening is um, individually, it is true that individual charges will be emanating sort of a Coulombic field. But as was true with the parallel plate capacitor, neighboring charges are also emanating a Coulombic field meaning radially or spherically, or spherically symmetric and radially outwards. So we see that all the up and down components will cancel out and all of the left right components will superimpose and become strong. So overall, what we're gonna end up getting is a field, come on, is a field 
that looks straight, very similar to what we had for a parallel plate capacitor. However, we also have the same field going backwards. If you recall as a sort of a side note, if we have a parallel plate capacitor, we have the field inside, but there was no field, there was no field outside. And that might be counterintuitive for you because you might be thinking, but Mark, you know, you just said it's a Coulombic E field, you know, aren't these things also pointing backwards? You're not wrong. They are pointing backwards, but you also have to remember these negative charges also emit a negative charge or a negative E field backwards. And those two will cancel out. And the reason we know this, in fact, and I, I explained this in that lecture, is if you take a Gaussian surface to enclose the entire capacitor, then the total enclosed charge is zero. Which means there's no E field overall outside of the electric field or outside of the, the parallel plate capacitor. Um, I, I'm sort of oversimplifying that just a little bit, but for the purposes of first year, um, that, that's more than sufficient. You know, if you have a, a Gaussian field, uh, sorry, a, a Gaussian surface that encompasses the, all of the plates, both plates together, the total enclosed charge is zero. And then that means EA uh, equals zero over epsilon naught, which means E equals zero over A epsilon naught, which means E equals zero. Okay, so that's how you know E equals zero outside of the two plates. Here, we do not have a second plate. So here, if we draw a Gaussian surface, we do not have anything, I mean, the total enclosed charge is non-zero, right? There's no negatives to sort of balance out or to cancel out any of the field lines. So that's what's different in, in this scenario compared to other scenarios. So step one, we, we have a, a sort of a, a structure for the E field. Now we have to use Gauss's law to find the value for the E field. So there's my Gaussian surface. It's sort of a, a smaller version of a rectangular prism. And again, this is a box. That's terrible. So I'll just draw it separately. Oh boy, I do not know how to draw. Okay. Okay, there. There's my Gaussian surface and uh, my, my sheet. kind of goes through it, okay? Um, we know the field lines are coming out like this. So we say here for step two, we have to use Gauss's law. Gauss's law is E dot DA equals total enclosed charge over epsilon naught and E dot DA is going to be the total flux and more specifically the total flux is going to be the total number of field lines that pass through the surface. We have six faces of our surface. Okay, so when we use Gauss's law, we have to say it's the flux through the top plus the flux through the bottom plus the flux through the front plus the flux through the back plus the flux through the left plus the flux through the right. So we, we, we sort of had the same um, construct as, as we did with the parallel plate capacitor, right? We, we used a box, we used the same shape of Gaussian surface. Uh, we broke it down into, into six uh, individual flux elements. And we're doing that now too. So let's look at our diagram. How many electric field lines, how many electric field lines are going through the top? 
I would say zero, right? The top, there's nothing going through the top. All the field lines are traveling either to the left or to the right. So this, this guy is zero. There's no, there's no flux through the top. Similarly, there's no flux through the bottom. How about through the front surface? Again, no, all the field lines are traveling either left or right. Nothing is coming out of the page or into the page. So front is zero, back is zero. However, left, how many field lines are going through the left face? Well, there are E, whatever the strength of the E field is, I don't know what that is yet. It's gonna be E times the area of our Gaussian surface um, to the left, but left is, is outwards. And then to the right, it's gonna be the same thing. To the right, it's also outwards. So it's also gonna be EA and this is gonna be EA or A of the Gaussian surface equals the total enclosed charge, oh boy, total enclosed charge over epsilon naught. So um, now if we're solving, we're gonna get uh, two times EA equals total enclosed charge over epsilon naught. And that means our electric field is Q enclosed over two epsilon naught times area of our Gaussian surface. This looks very similar to the parallel plate capacitor. If you recall, the parallel plate capacitor was E equals Q over epsilon naught A. So now we just have a two in there. And we have a two mainly because um, we have two sides. Oh, what's happening? We have two sides that are now contributing to the flux. Whereas with the electric, uh, sorry, with the parallel plate capacitor, we only had one side that was contributing to the flux. So instead of dividing by one, we're now dividing by two. Now, we're still not quite done. What is the total enclosed charge? Well, with the parallel plate capacitor, we were able to say our Gaussian surface could be encompassing the entire plate. And then the total enclosed charge would just be the total charge on that plate. With an infinite sheet, however, you can't just enclose the whole plate. It's an infinite plate. So how much total charge is on that plate? It's an infinity amount of charge. And you know, if you did that, you would get an infinite amount of charge divided by Q epsilon naught times infinity. Because the area would be infinity. It's an infinitely large plate. Well, infinity over infinity is an indeterminate form, if you recall from calculus. It's not necessarily one, like the answer here isn't one over two epsilon naught. Um, it's, it is also not necessarily infinity. Okay, so what we do is here we say, okay, we know we can't take an infinite chunk. Let's just take a slice, right? A Gaussian surface is an arbitrary surface anyway. I can make it as big as or as small as I want. So if I take a slice, as I've shown here, I can say how much charge, oops, how much charge is in this, slice. How much charge is in the slice? Well, we know from the question that there were 5.8 picocoulombs per square meter. So here I can say how much charge, oh I'm still writing in red, how much charge is within my Gaussian surface? Well it's it's the surface charge density multiplied by the area. This is the surface charge density, which is obviously in coulombs per square meter. And this is obviously area measured in square meters. So coulombs per square meters times square meters is gonna be coulombs, it's gonna be charge. And then we divide this by two epsilon naught area. And then the two areas cancel out. And then you get sigma over two epsilon naught. 
And this is mind blowing. This says the electric field due to an infinite sheet is a constant value. This means you could be close or far away, it doesn't matter. The electric field is the charge density sigma, in this case 5.8 picocoulombs, divided by 2 epsilon naught. Those are all constant values. You could be a millimeter away from the plate, you could be a light year away from the plate. It doesn't matter. It's the same strength of electric field. Now, of course, this is mind boggling because you're thinking to yourself, eh, I don't feel an electric force on things when I'm sitting here in my house. Well, it's because there is no such thing as, as an infinite plate. Had there been an infinite plate, then yes, we would feel it, but there, it, it, it's physically impossible to have an infinite plate. So this is why this is not really a realistic example, but it's a fun theoretical example nonetheless. Anyway, where does that leave us? Well, we now have the electric field. Let's go back and figure out what we need. Okay, what is part A? How much work is done by the electric field if a particle is moved this far? Well, we have this charge. What was my charged particle? Uh, proton, it was a proton. So this is gonna be QE, well, I guess positive electron, whatever. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times the electric field, we've already figured out the electric field is sigma over two epsilon naught, and then times D. And here we have everything. We have everything uh, given from the question. So here you could just plug in your values. D, D is simply 3.56 centimeters. Sigma is that value. Um, charge, where was charge? Charge was this thing. Charge was that thing right there. And then epsilon naught is just a constant which you can look up. And it, it'll also be on every formula sheet. Okay, so that's, that's how you find uh, the work done there. Um, B was, what is the electric potential? Well, again, the electric potential, now that we know E is constant, beautiful, E is constant, I love it. Now that we know E is constant, we know delta, delta V equals E D, or more specifically, sigma over two epsilon naught D. Done. Now, also, I should be clear here, um, it's the change in potential, right, delta V. We were defining V to be zero at the plate. And what we're doing here is we are moving a positive charge away from positive charges. It naturally wants to go away from a positive charge. Okay, spontaneously it will feel a force of repulsion, which means it's actually going to a lower potential energy. So this is gonna be a negative value because it's going lower. Okay, so there you go. That's what this is saying here. The magnitude is this, but because it's following the E field, it's gonna be negative. Okay. Um, here is a nice little question here. Uh, I'll leave that to you to review. This is in the posted slide, so you don't even have to like rewind through the video. Um, I'll leave that for you to review. Oh, what's happening? Okay. Well, that jumped far. So in the last few minutes, I just want to cover capacitance. This won't take long. So here, um, I want to loop back to something I, I sort of started but never finished. Um, I said E was equal to Q over epsilon naught A, which equals v, delta V over D. This is a very interesting equation. And this really begs the question, um, what, what is the point of a parallel plate capacitor? And really the point is not just to make students' lives hard, um, they're very useful in real life. It, it's actually to store charge, um, to charge Q on, on the plates. So the main point of a parallel plate capacitor is to store charge Q. Kind of like a battery. You can, you can charge a parallel plate capacitor with Q and then use that charge Q at a later time. 
So we, it would be really nice to sort of figure out how easy an apparel plate capacitor can store charge. Um, not just how easily, but how much charge a parallel plate capacitor can hold. You know, if I want to power my house for five minutes with a parallel plate capacitor, I can't just take two pieces of tin foil and hold them together, you know, close together. There's no way that can hold enough charge to power my house for like even five minutes. So we need to sort of think about why, what, what features of a parallel plate capacitor govern its ability to hold charge. So what we start with is defining that, that characteristic. We call this capacitance. So capacitance is going to be a capacitor's ability to hold charge. That's what the first bullet point says here. Um, if you want a sort of analogy, again, I, I, I told you with electricity, you can always think of, of water flow and water flow is almost directly analogous to electricity in, in almost every single way. Um, how do you put capacitance in, in context of water flow? It's like a bucket. You know, if, if I, if I hand you a, if you're, you know, let's say something's flooding, there's a leak in the ceiling and you're like, Mark, get me a pail. And I come back and I get you like a, you know, like a, a tiny little Tupperware container that you might put a sandwich in. You know, you're like, well, Mark, it's a constant leak. This thing's going to fill up really quickly. I'm like, well, how do you know it's going to fill up really quickly? I got you a bucket. And you're like, well, Mark, look at the volume. The volume of the bucket is really small. So, you know, what, what determines how much water a bucket can hold? It's volume. How much volume can a capacitor hold? That's what capacitance is for. So, you know, the capacitance in a capacitor is analogous to the volume in a bucket. Obviously, the bigger the volume of the bucket, the more water it can hold. The bigger the capacitance of a capacitor, the more charge it can hold. So, what goes in to capacitance? What features of a parallel plate capacitor govern how much or how little um, a charge it can hold? And this is where that equation came in. We had the Q over epsilon naught A, and we also had the delta V over D equations. So if you equate those two together, Q over epsilon naught A equals delta V over D, we ask ourselves, well, what are the two independent and dependent variables here? Well, we have batteries and have, when we have electricity, so voltage is the independent variable. And the, the variable we're interested in is the uh, D, that's not a D, is the dependent variable. And everything else is just properties, inherent intrinsic properties of the capacitor, right? The, the battery, the voltage difference felt between the two plates is not a function of the capacitor itself, right? It's something we can control. It's, it's independent of the capacitor. Um, and Q is a result of, of everything put together. So what I'm doing here is I'm rearranging this equation uh, and voltage is by itself, Q is by itself, and then everything else is sort of lumped together. And then everything else is sort of labeled as the capacitance. So we get this nice little fun equation, Q equals CV. The charge on the plates equals the capacitance on the plates multiplied by the voltage between the plates. And that's, uh, and capacitance is given by epsilon naught A over D, which means how do you, how do you affect the, the ability a, a, a parallel plate capacitor has to hold charge? Well, you could increase the area of the plates. You could move the plates closer together. If you decrease D, you increase capacitance. Or weirdly, you could increase the, the epsilon value. And this is the notion of dielectrics. Dielectrics are our material or media that can be polarized. Dielectrics are not a uh, conducting material. They are insulators. They do not allow electricity to pass. However, when you apply an electric field, um, which you will obviously have between two plates, um, there will be an electric field that sort of passes through 
this piece of, say, styrofoam. Styrofoam is an insulator. But styrofoam, as you know, uh, can be polarized because, you know, it, it sticks to your hand, you know, you rub it on your hair. It can be polarized. So when you have this sort of external electric field, you can orient the individual positive and negatives within a certain, let's say, atom or molecule, styrofoam molecule, and you can orient them. And what you end up having is inside, you have a weaker electric field, not zero. It's not a conductor, right? Inside a conductor, the electric field is always zero, but this is not a conductor, so it won't perfectly cancel out. It'll only a little bit cancel out. So, you know, here you're missing one, but as you can see in the diagram, there's still, there's still a few field lines that survive. Um, it won't perfectly cancel out, but what you're doing, weirdly, what you're doing with a dielectric is you're making the electric field inside the capacitor weaker, and that has, uh, with the same voltage, that, that allows you to, to store more charge. So that's, that's what's going on here. Um, and if that, I can understand that might be a little bit confusing, I would just recommend falling back on the equation. You see here as epsilon goes up, you increase the capacitance. Okay. Um, we introduce a new variable, it's called kappa. It's the Greek letter kappa. And we don't need to introduce a new variable. It's just, again, we're lazy. So um, we can understand that if we introduce styrofoam or rubber or something like that, it is going to have a, a different epsilon value uh, compared to that of air uh, or a vacuum. So all we're saying is, um, you know, if you have C equals epsilon, um, epsilon A over D, you know, epsilon is like 8 point something times 10 to the minus 21 or something really small. So if, if epsilon of rubber is like, you know, like 10 point something times 10 to the minus 21, that's, it's really hard for us to, to, to think about the context of different epsilon values because the values are really small and decimally. So what we do is we say, well, how different is epsilon compared to that, oops, that of a vacuum. Oops. And so we just say, okay, kappa is going to be how much bigger epsilon is compared to epsilon naught. And then we're simply able to say the capacitance of a capacitor is simply going to be um, the Greek letter kappa times epsilon naught A over D. And this is going to be kappa. Not the, not the electric constant, not 9 times 10 to the 9. It's kappa. So kappa are usually like 1. 1 would be for a vacuum. 1.5 would be, you know, 1.5 times that of a vacuum. Um, stuff like that. Okay, um, the last thing uh, I want to show you before letting you go is uh, we have a new source of electrical potential energy. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, uh, we now, uh, like instead of compressing a spring, we can now store electrical potential energy inside a capacitor like a battery. Um, without going through a lengthy derivation, um, I will say that the electrical potential energy stored within a capacitor uh, is one half Q times V. And what you can do here is you can use Q equals CV to sort of have some rearrangements of this equation. So if you wanted to get rid of Q, you could represent Q with C times V. So one half QV is going to be one half CV times V, which is one half CV squared, which is where this comes from. Or alternatively, if you wanted to get rid of V, you could say V is Q over C. And then you could get rid of, you know, we have one half QV. Let's say, say you want to get rid of V, you know, one half Q, um, V was Q over C. So this is going to be one half Q squared over C, which is where this one comes from. So all, the, all three of those equations for energy in a capacitor, they're all equivalent. It's just you use whichever one is more convenient for you. Um, do you have capacitance and voltage? Well, if you, if you do, use the middle one. Do you have voltage in Q? Then use the first one. Do you have capacitance in Q? Use the last one. Whichever one you have, you use. Okay, 
So there's uh, some conceptual examples here. I can let you go through those conceptual examples on your own. We might do a few of them maybe tomorrow morning, or I guess tomorrow afternoon at the beginning of lecture, just to sort of spruce your memory. But um, that, is, that is really the end of, of um, I guess, this chapter. We've talked about voltage, we've talked about capacitors, and we've talked about um, dielectrics and capacitance as well. So we might do a little bit of review tomorrow at the beginning of lecture, but then we're gonna promptly uh, move on to another another chapter. So please take some time, carve out some time, and do some homework, uh, practice problems. We've done voltage now, so you can do voltage problems. Do conservation of energy problems involving um, electrical potential energy, and do some capacitor problems uh, as well. So hopefully, hopefully with some practice, that'll um, that'll do. So we'll touch base tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. And if anyone has uh, any questions, I'll hang back and, and answer some of the questions. But if you're watching this on YouTube later, I will see you tomorrow. Ciao.